Good morning and welcome to Little Rock and Original Free Will Baptist Church. Um, you can tell that we're bringing this from Jerusalem, Israel, and we'll do anything to make our customers happy and our viewers. Um, but seriously, this is our setup for Vacation Bible School. And if you're in the area, please come. Uh, I think it's next week. And uh, contact the church and, and come to see us for Vacation Bible School, Bible study, church service, and Sunday school. But we appreciate you viewing and sharing uh, these services with other people. And as I, let me remind you to please hit the su subscribe button or press it. Don't hit it or mash it. Just press it. And also to hit the like button or the other button that will be unnamed. And also to share. And share it with friends and neighbors and uh, invite them to join you and us as we study God's Word together. The title for today's lesson is Helping, H-E-L-P-I-N-G. It's taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. That's Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And this is a very common um, lesson is actually the parable of the Good Samaritan that if you have uh, studied much at all I'm sure you have read it but I'm going to teach this lesson hopefully to those that have not heard and I've got a couple of things that through my studying and, and prayer that I think needs to be brought out that I, I actually had never thought about before so as we go to the Lord in prayer, please remember those individuals uh, for which you would like to pray, and especially those that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, or that have, have um, not been following Him over the last while, that they will come and have a fellowship with Him. Also, situations uh, in the world today, uh, politically, socially, economically, um, morally, all these things. But also, let us remember here in eastern North Carolina to pray for God's providence with rain. We are extremely parched and dry uh, right now as we speak. And... Um, is forecasting for rain tonight and perhaps some storms. We pray for God's um, peace and for us to have the faith that is necessary, believing that God will provide for our needs. Um, as we pray right now, remember these as we pause and let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege of coming today and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel good news of Christ to those in the world. Heavenly Father, we are mindful of your love and your grace and your mercy is constant and sometimes Lord that as as we pray and as we live sometimes it seems that you are silent and Lord we know that during these silent times that we need to seek your word and seek for you that that we, we need you, Lord, and, and we love you. And Lord, as we pray right now, we lift up these names of, of people and for inter intercessory prayers and, Lord, for situations um, for which we are all aware. We lift them up right now to you, Lord.
Father, hear our prayers. Hear the prayers of the viewers right now, Lord, that in the privacy of their homes or wherever they are, that these situations and intercessions are just as valid as any worship service that we might have. We present them to your throne of grace that you will give us, God, what we don't deserve, but what we know that you desire for us. Help us to love you with all of our soul, strength, and mind. And help us to be loving and compassionate to our neighbors. We thank you for this privilege of bringing your word once again to the viewers. And Lord, we don't take it for granted that, Lord, that they're taking their valuable time to listen to this. And we pray, Lord, that they might have a closer relationship from having listened. We pray all these things that your son's name might be glorified. Amen. Last Sunday we studied about Christ has sent out his 12 disciples to go on um, a mission and reach out and spread the gospel message of, of, of Jesus Christ. And also he sent out 70 and they came back with a, from a triumphant mission. And they preached and presented the kingdom of God to others. And, and we know that there were those that listened and those that perhaps did not. In today's lesson, we have a lawyer and other um, um, versions of the Bible say that he was a scribe, came to Jesus and came to test Jesus. Now I ask you, how many of you would like to have a verbal exchange at this time with Jesus and try to test him and trick him into saying something um, incorrect. And the purpose of your testing Jesus would be to get him to say something wrong that you could discredit him and his words. Heaven forbid that we would ever try to test Jesus. Because we know he desires the best for us and, and those that put their trust in him. But he came to Jesus and he recognized that he was a great teacher. He says, teacher, what must I do to inherit in eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is it written in the law? What do you read there? Whether well, the scribe or the lawyer would spend all his time in studying the law. And they were experts on the law. And of course, Jesus knew the desire of this man in his heart. Now, the lawyer responded, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. 
and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this same question was presented to Jesus in other scripture. I think it's in Matthew. What is the greatest of all the laws? And Jesus responded from these two. Now, that wasn't accidental. The J Jewish men would wear, although it probably wouldn't be very cool in 2022, and they usually were cool from the 1960s, <laughs> but it wouldn't be very cool to wear a phylactery, which was a little box on your head and on your left arm. And on, in those little boxes were parts and scriptures of the Torah. Now, the most common one was from Deuteronomy, which is love God with all your heart, etc. And the other is from Leviticus, to love your neighbor as you, you love yourself. And Jesus said in Matthew that of all the 613 or so laws of Moses, this went from the Ten Commandments to 613. Of all of these, these are the two most important. All the laws of the prophets hinge like a door, hinge on these two laws. That shows you how important they are. And he knew that the lawyer what the lawyer was thinking, and he responded correctly. So he wasn't trying to um, discredit the lawyer's answer. It was exactly correct. And he says to him, um, ding, 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 you gave the right answer. You do this, and you will live. Remember the question? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus was presenting him this, Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you truly do this, you will live. All right, now... Here comes part of the tricky part. And today's lesson is entitled Helping. I think a better lesson title would be Compassion. The compassion that we as Christians should have and the compassion that church people, including the Jews, should have had all along. But here the lawyer is wanting to justify himself, he asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Um, the whole purpose of the lawyer asking Jesus after this dialogue is, okay, who is my neighbor? He wanted to know the scope of what was encased in being uh, who would be his neighbor. He was really wanting to limit God and make him into a nice little package and saying, well, only my Jewish friends are my neighbor, or the one that lives close to me is my neighbor, or maybe my family is my neighbor. But surely, <laughs> surely don't expect it to go beyond that. Tell me, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, and he tells him 
this parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem. I hear Jerusalem uh, is about 2,500 feet, about a half a mile above sea level. And a man was going to Jericho, which was about 800 feet below sea level. And, and by the way, did you know that Jericho is today, in 2022, the oldest city um, inhabited 800 feet below sea level? And he fell in the hands of robbers who stripped him of his clothes and probably stole them, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, as I was preparing this lesson, I never thought so much about the man that had been beaten, but can you imagine the fear that he must have felt Fear that he was going to die and no one was around to help him. And this road from Jerusalem down 3,000 feet to Jericho was known for a place for robbers to hide and murder people and steal from them. And the fear he must have had if he had family members and, and a wife and children the how he must have been thinking, well, is this it? Well, Jesus goes on and says, now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite whom he came, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Here, a priest came by, a man of God, a man from the tribe of Aaron, and he frequently went to and from Jerusalem. And he saw this man, and he didn't know if he was dead or not. But what's the problem? He didn't want to be unclean. And for him to be in the presence of a dead person would make him ceremonially unclean. And the same was true with a Levite who was a the religious tribe of, uh, of Israel. And he also in like manner went to the other side because the man might have been dead and for him to do anything would make him ceremonially unclean. I thought about this today, and it hit me for the first time. Jesus wasn't condemning the Levite and the priest. But look at the missed opportunity that these two men had. And the question that I have for you and myself, because I too am convicted from this lesson in a way perhaps I never have been, how many missed opportunities can we afford ourselves to have? 
And these are missed opportunities of commission and omission. We can make these missed opportunities perhaps as these two religious people did by a conscious decision not to help because it would make them unclean. Or we can miss these opportunities just because we were not at the right place at the right time. And then we have, and, and, and here's a, a trick in the story. Not, I hate to use the word trick. Here's a, a, a difference to this story that perhaps the lawyer was thinking was coming next. You have the priest, the Levi, and then perhaps the lawyer is thinking the next thing he's going to say is that a Jewish man came down the road and he helped the man in trouble. Yay, Jewish man. This is one of ours. Yay. But Jesus didn't say that. Who did he say came a Samaritan? And you know, she just didn't say a good Samaritan. I think that's just a translation and transliteration over the years. But here's the deal. Jews hated Samaritans. Why? Because when the northern kingdom of Israel was taken over by Assyria, that Assyria sent people into Israel to marry, and they did. So the purity of the of the um, uh, uh, of the Jewish nation was clouded because of these mixed marriages. And most people don't talk about this, but the Samaritans also hated the Jews. Why? Because of their piety. And also, when the Assyrians, when the Jews wanted to rebuild the temple, they asked the Samaritans to help. And the Samaritans said, Nah, we're not going to help. We're going to build our own place of worship out at Mount uh, Gerasim. So you can have your temple. We're going to have our temple. So there was animosity between them. And I thought about, of course, the Andy Griffith show when we had the Carters and the Wakefields feuding. And the Carters, Andy, Sheriff Andy Taylor interviewed Mr. Carter and he says, why are you feuding? He says, because they're shooting at us. Well, why are you shooting at us? Why are they shooting at us? Because we're feuding. And so this went back and forth, and they never really even knew why they were feuding. But the Samaritans and the Jews knew why they were um, um, feuding. Also, in the hierarchy of, of social ladders, the Samaritans were beneath Jewish slaves. They were beneath Israelites with a small blemish. They were beneath Israelites with a grave blemish and beneath Gentile slaves. So they were bottom of the social ladder. And this is a person that Jesus uses to give an illustration of the way that we all should look at our neighbors. So, um, so he says, A Samaritan, while traveling, came upon near him. When he saw him, he was moved with pity. I think it was pity, but even more so, compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, and having poured oil and wine on them, then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and looked, took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, which was two days' wages, 
and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Notice the contrast of what nothing had been done and this Samaritan, this half-breed Samaritan, this person that Jews hated, and he says he took him and took him to town. He took care of his knees. He put oil and wine on him. He put him on his own animal, and he walked and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next morning he got up, gave money to the innkeeper, and said, I'm going to be coming back this way. If you spend more money on him, let me know, and I'll be glad to meet those needs. And then he goes on and says, And Jesus asked this lawyer, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? Who do you think, Mr. Scribe, was the neighbor? And look at the bias in this lawyer's mind and the way he was thinking. Do you think for one minute, and it's in the scripture, that he said the Samaritan is the one that showed mercy? No, he says the one who showed mercy. He's the one that was the neighbor. And Jesus tells him, go and do likewise. This commentary I had says, Who is my neighbor? The neighbor was the Samaritan who approached the wounded man and made him his neighbor. The neighbor is not he whom I find in my path, but rather he in whose path I place myself, he whom I approach and actively seek. We as Christians, we as the church of Jesus Christ as the head, don't need to be necessarily where the neighbor is. We need to seek out the neighbor and find and find out in what way that we can help him. It's recorded in John chapter 4, verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? I love God with all of my heart. Yea. And then I hate my neighbor. How can you, as John says, how can you hate your neighbor who you seen and live and do with and you, you don't show your love in Jesus Christ? When Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem in conclusion and the lawyer was looking for the scope, really, of who is his neighbor? How much do I need to love my neighbor? And really, I want my God in a little box that I can pull out when I need him. How much do I love him? Jesus said... on the cross and is finished. I have completed my task of dying for you and loving you. Mercy there was great and grace was free and pardon there was multiplied to me. 
There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary.